Hello, boys and girls. Perlo Wisdom here from Be Pow Picks and the Perlo Wisdom Show that uh, I don't do as often anymore. But I do go on, go check out the sports beard. We go, well, we're going to be going like three, four times a week, two hours in the evening on his show, the sports beard. That's him and Rico, my buddy Rico. And we'll be doing all the NHL action in the land. It's going to be so much fun. There's going to be so much frolic. My daughter made this for me. Well, she got it made for me for my birthday. Because I like the frolic, don't you know? And today we're going to be looking at the Pittsburgh Penguins. And FanDuel has put out their plus minus season totals for the 2023-24 season. We did Philadelphia. I just did Philadelphia. Did the Rangers. I haven't put Philadelphia out yet. Sorry about that. The Rangers. Carolina. And now we're doing the Pittsburgh Penguins. We're predicting the over or under based on FanDuel's line of whether they'll be over or under that total, which we'll look at in a second. We're going to look at some Pretty funky analytics from J Fresh Analytics. I'm a professional sports handicapper, and his analytics are my favorite. It's not the only ones I use, but I, for the sake of this video, we're just going to use his. We're going to look at each individual player. What's the strength and strengths and weaknesses of Pittsburgh, and what are the odds that they do go over the total they've given? So let's look at the total now, shall we? This is FanDuel right here. It's one of the finest in the land. You might want to check it out. Um, 98.5 points. Now, the interesting thing about this is last year they had 91. They're, they're thinking that Pittsburgh's going to rebound eight more points from last year. So we're going to look at the possibility that that may be the case. Uh, possibly them getting Carlson might have affected this but i do believe this line was set even before they got carlson in the deal that they had so i would say that there's something maybe just thinking it's a down year that has them believing that it was a one-off and they're going to come back and do well this year what do i think well let's take a look shall we uh, first of all, the Pittsburgh Penguins, here we go, um, look at their, uh, this is their depth chart, um, made a few moves, big one of course, uh, is getting Eric Carlson on the right side there, and uh, Ryan Graves from the New Jersey Devils, and when we get to the defense, you're going to find some pretty neat analytics there. We also have Riley Smith, Crosby, and Russ. But before we get into that, we're going to look at a guy who won't be in the lineup opening night by the sounds of it. Um, and I found something pretty interesting with this that I did not even know, to tell you the honest truth. I, I, whoops. Ooh. Sorry about that. Jake Gunsel. 98% offense, 1% even strength defense. I'm actually even surprised Crosby would. And this has not been, this This here is your three-year chart. 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23. <coughs> and he has never been good at even strength defense, ever. And I'm surprised it hasn't been called out a bit by Sidney Crosby, actually. But if you're... If, you're, if you are controlling the offense at a 98% level, which means that only 2% of the league can do it better, you can get away with that, It's but it's not ideal nonetheless. Hence the reason why is projected war, which is wins above replacement. In other words, how many, what percentage of players in the league would be better than him in that spot at the top left wing or right wing, usually left wing spot, and he's better than 75%. So he's well above average of a player, even with that poor de those poor defensive analytics. I'm going to be really watching Jake Gunsel to see where it is that he is missing here. Is he cherry picking? Is the coach kind of saying, don't worry about it? I want you to take a lot of risks. I imagine that must be the case. His shooting is fantastic. Like He has all the tools. He's amazing. We know Jake Gunsel. He's the next 40-goal scorer. 
It's not like he's a bad player, but that defense, for my money, needs to get better. Like you, it's just especially when it comes to the playoffs. Um, last year he had what thirty six goals, just under a point a game. All good, but I want to see a better defensive effort, no doubt about it. All right, let's look at Sid the Kid, shall we? Uh, he's not as He's not as uh, elite as he once was, but for 35 years old, he's doing pretty darn good. And you notice he got a 50% even strength defense. That's pretty much where he's been uh, his his whole career. Besides two years ago when he was just a beast and I was calling for him to get the Selkie. Um, I wonder, and if you notice, he was even down defensively now. One of the reasons why the uh, why players will have such poor five on five defense is if you're chasing the game a lot. If the whole team is chasing the game a lot, a lot you're going to take more risks and you're going to throw the defense out the window and you're going to try to score, right? So I think that might have dropped it a little bit for Crosby. He's an elite center, still is an elite center. I mean, he's not as elite, but he's pretty damn good. 94% projected war. Um, the thing we're going to look at here as we go through all these is, or take into account, the last three teams to win the Cup, Tampa Bay, Vegas, and uh, Colorado, had max two players that were poor even strength defensively from their offense, from their forwards. Max two. It is the trend now. Um, and we're going to see in Pittsburgh if they come close to being able to match that trend. Uh, the next is Brian Rust, the guy that's worked his butt off to get to where he, where he is. Uh, he was like a third round pick. Uh, I, I love him for his work ethic and getting the most that he can out of that smallish body of his. To be able to play with guys like Crosby and uh, put up some pretty good numbers. As you can see, his even strength defense is not very good. Last year, he had kind of an up year defensively. He's sort of overrated in a lot of ways. He's basically mostly an average third liner. His, he, he was down a little bit offensively last year, up a little bit defensively. But like you said, the 30% war means that 70% of the wingers out there would be better than him on the second line. And that makes sense to me because I never thought of him as a top liner. He's a guy that just happened to make it work the best he could. To me, he's a third line winger, and I think his numbers would get a heck of a lot better if they – had him in that spot. Unfortunately, they don't have the luxury to do so because they don't have a player to replace them. Um, and they can't afford to get anybody. And they're paying them $5 million a year. So they got what they got. Uh, I, I think they overpaid a little bit. People slam me for that when they just, when I said that about Brian Rust. But I always thought of him as a third liner. And I know he's put up some points here and there. But um, as a whole, you, I think you're going to see regression too after now getting past the age of 31. Gunsell would normally be here, and Riley Smith would come down here with Malkin and Raquel. But I want to look at Riley Smith because this was also something that surprised me, and it's also something that's worrisome. As you can see, 34% even, even strength defense as a second liner. So far, we have one player in the top six, and that being Crosby, that's just average that way. So they went out and got... They went out and got Riley Smith. And remember, this is Dubas, who's supposed to be the analytical genius, right? When I got Riley Smith, I, you know, had not looked at Riley Smith's analytics. I, for some reason, just assumed he was a great defensive player. Remember when I told you there was two players in Vegas that had under 50% uh, even strength defense? Riley Smith was one, and significantly, and actually... He actually had a better year than normal. I don't know why I just automatically assumed. Um, and, you know, he, he's the kind of guy that I test wise. He looks like he's working his bag off. So I'm going to take a look at, uh, I'm going to really watch Riley Smith. Uh, uh, 
a lot of people will say that don't do analytics will say, you know, I just got to watch the games. Well, I'm an old school guy. I resisted analytics for quite some time until as a professional handicapper, I couldn't deny that the best handicappers in the world, and I think I'm one of them now, <laughs> paid attention to analytics heavily. And also, there's another thing. Joe Sackick, heavily analytic Colorado. Vegas, McCrimmon, heavy into analytics. Tampa Bay, Breezebois, total analytics. Next up and coming team, New Jersey Devils, Fitzgerald, total analytics. Best teams out of the league right now are heavily analytically driven. So I can't deny it anymore. And this doesn't bode well. And Dubas is supposed to be an analytics expert. But here he goes out and gets Riley Smith, who, to add to a team that already is poor for their forwards in their top six defensively. I don't know. It doesn't bode well for me. Uh, I get He's going to get his offense. He is, you know, an average second liner, no doubt about that. But does he turn the needle all that much? Not for me. Not for me. Um so with that being said, Riley Smith would go down here and Nieto would come down here. Uh, would go to left wing here. He'll go there with Malkin and Raquel. So let's look at Malkin. What do you think Malkin's defensive analytics are going to be? I bet you can all guess what you think. I bet you can all guess without even looking. Eye test and everything. Not good. <laughs> yeah, his offense certainly makes up for it. But we're saying that about a lot of players right now. Gunsel. Malkin, you know, not good defensively. And then you wonder, okay, what happened last year? What happened last year? Why couldn't they make it last year? Well, they allowed a lot of goals, and they blamed it on Jari. Uh, it's not just Jari. This is a team that doesn't pay attention to defense. And when I say this, and these analytics are based on Defensive awareness all over the ice, not just whether you block some shots. You don't want to be blocking shots. Blocking shots means that you don't have the puck and they're in your zone. Two bad things. Uh, it, it's about making decisions all over the ice, in the offensive zone, defensive zone, neutral zone, everywhere, and not taking too many risks. This is a very selfish uh, I uh, Malkin seems to me like a very selfish player. He has all the tools to be a better defensive player than he does, and he just doesn't do it. Um, and I guess Gunsell learned from that because he's worse than he is. Now, don't get me wrong, his offense certainly makes up for his defensive liabilities. However, we've seen in the playoffs that this may work in the regular season, and they may be able to make it in. But in the playoffs, as we look through every one of these teams – Teams that have these sort of defensive analytics for every for most of their players don't do well in the playoffs. And everybody's scratching their head wondering what happened. That's what happened. Um, Raquel. Raquel, I do believe, kind of saves their face a little bit here for this line. Yeah, he's a little better. He's less than, but he's a little better defensively. His projected war puts him as an average first liner um, playing down in the second line, I think would be best for him. And I think you'd see more of, uh, especially when it comes to even strength defense, he, you would see that a lot better. Now, sometimes it's not always the player's fault where their analytics are poor. If you're playing a five on five man, man on man system, you're probably going to have poor even strength defense because most players just don't have the, I mean, ability physically to play that kind of way and have enough strength to be able to do both sides. A few superstars, guys like Bergeron and Barkov maybe, but most players wouldn't be able to do that. However, they don't play a five-on-five five defense or five-on-five five game. They play a zone. So these guys are leaving the zone quite a bit or not uh, playing in the zone uh, the way you're supposed to. And that's usually because you're taking risk. You're thinking pure offense and you're wanting to take off before the play is ready to do so so you can get goals. Um, and I just don't think Pittsburgh has the type of team that can produce that kind of offense and win, certainly not in the playoffs. But that's my – you can tell me what you think in the comment section there. So 
Uh, Matt Nieto, he will bring some defense here. And this was a pickup by no doubt about it. He will bring some defense. However, the only thing is, is he normally played on a fourth line. Yeah, huge defense. 91% even strength defense as a fourth liner, though. How is he going to be playing up in the lineup in the second and third lines? I know in San Jose that he did get some more chances up in the offensive side of the ledger, but when he went to Colorado, he pretty much played as a fourth liner. I think he could be a solid third liner. Look at See how he's all over the place here? Uh, very inconsistent. He was down the, in San Jose. He was actually down, and he came back up or in 2021-22, and he came back up. His offense has been all over the board. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, but do I think this is going to make up for all the defensive issues of all the other players? No, I don't. I don't. Um, like I said, in the regular season, you can get away with that anyways. You can get away with winning on pure offense in the regular season. Look at the Toronto Maple Leafs. They do it constantly. Edmonton Oilers, you know. They're, you you can make it in the regular season. But when you're playing a team seven times or, you know, in when, when they get to see where your weaknesses are and you're playing them over and over again in the playoffs, a good team like Vegas, as you saw last year, will eat you alive, man. They will eat you alive. Um, okay, so Drew O'Connor then. The Nieto would come down here. Drew O'Connor would go down to the fourth line. And uh, before I go on, okay, Noel Achari, I'm not going to look at the ana analytics, but he is very good defensively. This is a good spot for him. I'm glad he's getting a look on the third line. Um, but one thing is for sure, no way should Jeff Carter be playing ahead of Lars Eller. And we will look at that. No way in hell. You're just doing it because of his name or, you know, I've heard that Jeff Carter can be pretty whiny at times. Um, yeah, he's bad. He's really bad. Everybody knew it. You didn't need to look at analytics. He had a terrible year last year. And he actually had a little better year than he did the year before. So do I think he's going to be better this year? No. And his time on ice was a fourth liner because, yeah, they kept his, his time down. He's almost out of the league. In fact, I think he could be chased by a younger player, and we'll take a look at who that may be. But when you look at Eller in comparison, he played as a third liner. He was a below average third liner, but he's pretty strong defensively. He's above average defensively as a third liner. He's good on the PK. And his defense went sky high after going to Colorado last year because of their system, by the way. Is, that, are they going to, is he going to be able to replicate it? I don't know, but I definitely would take him over Carter. Carter should be playing nowhere in the top three lines. No way. In fact, if he's on your team, there's probably a problem with depth. And as you can see here, there is a problem with depth as far as two-way guys are concerned for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I think that's really their biggest problem. Um, and then they got Rem Pitlick and Vinny Henestroza. Vinny Henestroza, I'm not going to look at his analytics. He's an average guy. He's a good, solid fourth liner, actually. Um, I don't mind him for a fourth line. He's about average. The thing is, is you're saying that about a lot of forwards here as we go down every single average, 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 not good enough defensively. Um, they picked up Rem Pitlick. I, I haven't looked at his. Oh, yeah, terrible. Oh, my God. Yeah. Pure offensive guy, just a, 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 a playmaker that put out on the power play and put him on the fourth line and sheltered minutes and stuff like that. And that's what you're going to have to have because Alexander Nylander has been way too inconsistent me playing up. Andreas Janssen has gone so far south. I, I It's... When he did have analytics, they were terrible. I think it was because of after injury and stuff like that. Like, they have nobody to take over here. If they have injuries, they are in big trouble on the offense. All right, let's look at the defense. And this one blew me away. This is another one of those ones where I didn't pay attention enough to... To his analytics, um, I, I think of the last time I looked was two years ago, and I just assumed he was the same guy as he was two years ago. 
No. There's a reason why New Jersey didn't re-sign him. Two years ago, he was up as a three. He was up with one of the higher echelon um, defensemen in the league at 26 years old, as far as even strength defense is concerned. Now he kind of improved offensively, where he controls play at 53 percent in the offensive zone, but his defense has just gone way south. And I believe they picked him up to play with either. Latang, you know, to be that defensive stalwart on a line. And if that's the case, he's he's got to pick it up. Like, I this is more reason why I, I don't believe that Dubis is an analytics guy at all. I, I don't, he makes so many moves like this that is so light, uh, short sighted. I, I don't get it. Now, he has a pretty high uh, goals per 60 rate for a defenseman and assists. He's got all the tools. It just seems like, to me, he's lost confidence or lost his direction of what he's going to be as an NHL hockey player. And hopefully they can find it. And I imagine that's what Dubas is thinking. Like, okay, he had a down year. Uh, it looks like he's a little struggling in his identity. And maybe they'll find it here. Because they're going to give him an, a definite identity. This is what his identity is going to be. If he's playing with Eric Carlson as they have here in Cap Friendly, there's only one identity he's got. He's got to play defense because we all know, anybody who knows, knows Eric Carlson is one of the few players that has a zero rating for even strength defense. Zero. Now, his offense more than makes up for it. It's absolute. He's he's an absolute wizard offensively. I would still have him on my team. You can get away with a few guys like that, especially on the back end. But um, if Graves is going to be playing with him, he's going to be left out in the cold a lot, man. Like he's really going to have to do something. Um, I people ask me what do you, what did I think about the Eric Carlson move? If you have an ownership that's not letting you rebuild when you need to freaking rebuild, and they need to rebuild in Pittsburgh. But it's not always general managers. They got they have a they have to go by what own, the ownership direction wants to be. If you're an owner you're and you're saying, "Look, man, I, I don't want to suck for whatever. You I pay in you. You make us good. Build around Crosby and win something." Then I can understand why they made a move like this to tell you the honest truth. I mean, you might as well go for it. Might as well Maybe you can win with offense. Maybe you can get lucky. I don't know with signing Tristan Jari to $5 million for the next four or five years. If that's going to do it. I mean, he's faded in the playoffs so many times. Like, is it risky? Yeah, but they had to take a risk. I think that's what I'm trying to say. You had no choice but to take a risk. Because this roster, as we look at it constructed, on analytically, there's very, very little chance that Pittsburgh's going to win a cup. About the only way they're going to have to do it is if they get some miraculous offensive performances and some great goaltending because it's not built to do anything else. Um, next, Marcus Pedersen, their best defenseman. Yes, you said it. You heard me say it. That's Pedersen is their best overall defenseman. At least until they got, since they got Carlson. Look at this. His even strength offense is fantastic. Now, this is based on a second pair. If he were to play top pair, I'm not sure he would sit this high in war percentage. But I don't think it would be far off. He is the most one of the most underrated defensemen in the league. Now, here's something you might find interesting. His even strength offense is 86%. And that came flying through the roof last year. He just hit it out of the park. And he's at that 27 year old for a defenseman that's hitting his sweet spot you know this is they're hitting it's he's hitting his peak but only 60 percent 16 percent for goals per 60 he's, he's primarily a playmaker but he's also a play driver and he's a defensive five on five stalwart he's fantastic if anybody should be playing with carlson as far as i'm concerned it should be him we'll give graves i would be giving graves to Latang. Because um, since he's just trying to get back basically on his feet again to where he could be, 
Latang's even strength defense is not great either, but I mean at least it's not zero. And um I think Graves would be a little better that way. He 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 really tries to pay a little more attention to the defensive part of the game. But again, you've got a whole bunch of guys here, forward and defense, that basically are non existent defensively. Non existent. I start to wonder where you can even blame Jari anymore. Like, that's how it is. Like, he, he gets a lot of the flack. But somebody on this team's got to start be, having a consciousness defensively. I know you, you want to play a high-pressure offensive system, but you can't be this bad defensively. You can't. It, it just It's shown over and over again. Um with the people that players or teams that have been winning the cups. Finally, uh, Chad Ruedel, I'll just go in. He's actually a pretty solid defensive player. Not a bad guy for a guy who's never been drafted. I'm not going to go too far into him, but we will look up here. Joseph, because You see the same routine, 11% in strength defense. He's a pure offensive guy. Now, in his case, he's 24 years old. He might improve, but what is it? His, who's going to mentor him? You know, like, I think it's plain as plain as plain as plain can be. Pittsburgh is not going to be what everybody thinks they're going to be until they improve their even strength offense defense throughout their lineup. It's just not going to happen. So at 90, do I think they're going to improve 7.5 points this year? No, I don't. I I, I think people are going to be pretty disappointed in what happens to Pittsburgh this year again. And Carlson will help, no doubt about it. I mean, maybe he'll just go off and they'll just start outscoring everybody left, right, and center. But I got to see it first, and it'll be super impressive if he does, but... Um, even if they do happen to scrape in, I would say out of the first round. No doubt about it. All right, that's my full 42. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Comment in the comment section. Tell me what you think about all of this stuff. Have a great day. Okay, bye.